Bumer, Earth, Earth. Apa, Apa, Water, Water. Anala, Fire, Fire. Vayu, Vayu, Air, Air. Kam, Ether. Ether, Manaha, Manaha. Mind. Mind, Budi, Budi. Intelligence. Intelligence, Eva, Eva. Certainly. Certainly, Cha, Cha. And. And. and, Ahankara, Ahankara. False, ego. False Ego, Iti, Thus, Iyam, all these, May, my, Bina, separated, Prakriti, energies, Astada, eightfold, Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, and false ego. All together these eight constitute my separated material energies. We'll read that together. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence and false ego, all together, these eight constitute my separated material energies. Purport by Srila Prabhupada. The science of God analyzes the constitutional position of God and his diverse energies. The material nature is called Prakriti, or the energy of the Lord. In his different Purusha incarnations, expansions, as described in the Sattvata Tantra, Vishnu's tu Trini Rupani, Purushakyani Atovidu, Ekam tu Mahata Shastar, Divicham tu An Andasamstitam, Trityam Sarva Bhutastam, Tani Gyatva Vimuchate. For material creation, Lord Krishna's plenary expansion assumes three Vishnus. The first one, Mahavishnu, creates the total material energy, known as Mahatattva. The second, Garbhadakshya Vishnu, enters into all the universes to create diversities in each of them. The third, Shirodakshya Vishnu, is diffused as the all-pervading supersoul in all the universes and is known as Paramatma. He is present even within the atoms. Anyone who knows these three Vishnus can be liberated from material entanglement. That's good news, huh? The material world is a temporary manifestation of one of the energies of the Lord. Of the activities of the material world, I'm sorry, all the activities of the material world are directed by these three Vishnu expansions of Lord Krishna. These Purushas are called incarnations. Generally one who does not know the science of God assumes that this material world is for the enjoyment of the living entities and that the living entities are the Purushas, the causes, controllers, and enjoyers of the material energy. According to Bhagavad Gita, this atheistic conclusion is false. In the verse under discussion, it is stated that Krishna is the original cause of the material manifestation. Srimad Bhagavatam also confirms this. The ingredients of the material manifestation are separated energies of the Lord. Even the Brahma Jyoti, which is the ultimate goal of the impersonalist, is a spiritual energy manifested in the spiritual sky. There are no spiritual diversities in Brahma Jyoti, as there are in the Vaikuntas. And the impersonalists accept this Brahma Jyoti as the ultimate eternal goal. The Paramatma manifestation is also a temporary, all pervasive aspect of Shirodakshai Vishnu. The Paramatma manifestation is not eternal in the spiritual world. Therefore, the factual, absolute truth is a supreme personality of Godhead Krishna. He is the complete energetic person, and he possesses different separated and internal energies. In the material world, the principal manifestations are the eight as above mentioned. Out of these, the first five manifestations, namely earth, water, fire, air, and sky, are called the five gigantic creations, or gross creations, within which 
the five sense objects are included. They are the manifestations of physical sound, touch, form, taste, and smell. The material science comprises these 10 items and nothing more. But the other three items, namely mind, intelligence, and false ego, are neglected by the materialists. Philosophers who deal with mental activities are also not perfect in knowledge because they do not know the ultimate source of Krishna, the false ego, I am and it is mine, which constitute the basic principle of material existence, includes 10 sense organs for material activities. Intelligence refers to the total material creation called the Mahatattva. Therefore, from the eight separated energies of the Lord are manifest 24 elements of the material world, which are the subject matter of Sankhya atheistic philosophy. They are originally offshoots from Krishna's energies and are separated from him. But atheistic Sankhya philosophers with a poor fund of knowledge do not know Krishna as the cause of all causes. The subject matter for discussion in the Sankhya philosophy is only the manifestation of the external energy of Krishna that is described in Bhagavad Gita. So I will say a prayer to Prabhupada to open my eyes with a torchlight of knowledge. And please try to listen attentively because if you listen, then it is easier for me to speak if other people are listening to phones or doing things. It distracts it, and if Krishna sees you need to hear something, he will help me. And I need all the help I get. So first I will ask for the torchlight. This, here, there, the torchlight of knowledge. Om Ajnana Timranya Sahagina Gina Salakaya Chaksur in Militanyena Tazmai Shri Gurave Namaha Shri Chaitanya Manu Bistam Stapitam Yena Bhujali Shriyam Rupa Kadama Yandadanti Svapadanti Kam Dekam Shri Guru Shri Dada Guru Vaishnavam Stam So, earth, water, what are they? See, see, who can name one of them? How many are there? Seven? Who name one? Without looking. Earth, water, fire, air, ether, mind, intelligence, what else? False ego. So, as Prabhupada is discussing a few things in here, that the scientists generally don't go beyond these elements because the idea they see is that if I can't see it or touch it, it doesn't exist. Let's take that premise as true for a second. This is how you see it. If you can't see it, if, if you have to see it for it to be able to exist, what would that mean? Anybody have a cell phone? Who has a cell phone? Nobody here has a cell phone? Raise your hand. Okay. Does the cell phone work? It works. Now, can you see the waves coming into the cell phone? So therefore, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist, were true, the cell phone couldn't work, or you'd be able to see the waves. Because all the three things can't be true. It either means that it can't work, or because just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't work. So if you can't see it, it doesn't work, just like there's electricity there. And if you stick a fork in the wall, you can't see the electricity, so you won't feel the electricity, right? Is that correct? No, it's not correct. So these things to act are not necessarily dependent on you being able to see them. But of course, these are the things that are going to be the most subject, right? Like if this is a box, say, right? and you put a hundred rupees on top and inside the box is a lack of rupees but because we can't see that we think wow look what's here a hundred rupees is right there so that's what it is with this matter it is easily visible and therefore we see some value in it but we don't realize that behind the matter there may be something even more valuable but because we don't see it we figure it doesn't exist so this premise is not true just because I can't see it it doesn't exist so Prabhupada was talking here about the materialists how the materialists really have just the 
one system. There's matter. Matter comes in different forms, right? Earth, water, fire, air, ether. That's all I think of, just these first five, right? This is what exists. And they come in different forms. You know, water can mean gasoline. Which is more? A liter of, which is more volume? A liter of gasoline or a liter of water? Which is more volume? Who knows, which is more volume? What? They're the same, okay, which weighs more? A liter of water or a liter of gasoline? The water weighs more. So these things are liquid, but they have different, different consistencies depending on if you're looking at weight or volume. So this is the idea here, that water may come in different forms, gasoline, kerosene, water, so many other forms. And earth may come in wood, metal, so many forms. But basically, the scientists are just looking at the basic things that you can see. Earth, water, fire, air. Now Prabhupada was talking about the philosophers. In the second verse, Prabhupada um, kind of coins this term. He talks about the phenomenal and the numinous. And Prabhupada is talking about the philosophers here. Prabhupada knows the philosophers. In the second verse, what does he say? That um, I shall now declare unto you in full this knowledge, both phenomenal and numinous. Thus, being known, anything further shall remain. Nothing further shall remain for you to know. So this is kind of the two-part ideal, is they're looking at phenomenal and numinous. Who knows what that means? Anyone know? What is phenomena? What? You can see it, yes, it's the matter. So he's basically talking about the phenomenal, the things that we can see, and the things that we can can't see. And this is where some of the philosophers, they've gone to the second part system, like Rene Descartes. He says there's the phenomenal and the numinous. Now the phenomenal um, is the material world. And the numinous is the spirit and the mind. Because they're the same thing, right? Just like if a person's mind is gone, you say he's gone. Is that correct? They say that, right? Because the mind and the spirit are the same because we only have two things. We have the matter and we have the mind and the spirit, which are the same, correct? Is that correct? No. So is the mind the same as matter then? No, it's something in between. It's a subtle element. It's the thing that connects the gross to the subtle. And this is why we see that we have, that Prabhupada talks about the three-part system that we have. That there is God, there is the matter, and there are the living entities. Now the living entities are stuck in this matter because God is big. Like Mahavishnu, he's definitely so big. And Krishna can be big or small. He can walk inside the Agasura and he can expand himself and become big. He can become smaller than the smallest and bigger than the biggest. Which one of you can do that? Raise your hand. So um, he can do both. He's not subject to these laws of contradiction. So this is the three part, that there is a supreme God, there is living entities, and there is matter. Now if we are part of God, why is it that we can become subject to this matter? Well, we are called the Tathasta Shakti, who has been to the beach, to the ocean, now in the ocean, sometimes the land near the water is uncovered and it is in the sunlight. So it's just like us, when we're in the sunlight of the spirit, we are not covered by the material nature. But because we are so close to it, when the tide comes up, we may be covered by it. This is why we try to keep farther away from the ocean of Maya. Because if you're close to it, when the mode of goodness is prominent, 
you may get some spiritual inclination. And when the mode of ignorance is prominent, well, you get violent or you get intoxicated. And this is why it helps us to associate with the things that are at least in goodness, if not spiritually good. Because you can add spiritual to goodness and make it spiritual, but you can't offer the ignorance to Krishna and make it spiritual. So this is the three-part system. Rene Descartes and the others do not seem to understand the difference between the mind and the spirit. So therefore they think, this is why we see in some of the groups, the Jews, the Muslims, Christians, they bury the body because they think that we're body, mind, and soul. Um, but just like some philosophers say, I don't have, I'm not, I don't have a soul, I am a soul that has a body. So when they get confused about this matter, they don't know who they really are. This is the whole issue, if we don't know who you are, right? If we get confused, we will act improperly. So the philosophers don't understand this difference between the body and the soul, and the mind and the soul. If they understand, they think that um, the mind and the soul are the same. So, why does this matter sometimes work and sometimes doesn't? Like this box is just sitting here, right? But a car moves. Why does the car move? Because you've added some elements to it to make it move. Just like the shirt. You can put the shirt on you and, and the, when you walk out the door, the shirt and the dhoti also walk out the door, right? Does that mean that the shirt and the dhoti are capable of walking? Does it mean they have become alive? No, they, they are not. Just like a piece of metal is not fire, right? But if you put it in the fire, then it can become hot enough to create fire. So these energies are separated, but they can be used to be connected to Krishna. Just like the way we understand this is that they are separated energies because even though Krishna is entered as the atom, there is no life. We understand God is the supreme and the living entities, we can see when there is life, when they are born at a certain time, um, they grow, they create byproducts, other life, and eventually they dwindle, right? Whereas the piece of wood just sits there because it is a separated energy. Krishna is inside of this, right? It is just like this piece of metal is not electricity and neither is the socket electricity and neither is the camera. So how is electricity working through them? How? Because it's connected to the powerhouse. Just like if you have a plug and it's not connected inside. If you plug in the fan or the microphone, it won't work, right? Does that mean that the fan and the microphone don't work? No, it means they've been plugged in to the separated energy instead of the connected energy. So the fan and the microphone are like our spirit. And when they are plugged in to the separated energy, like the cord, say behind the socket, if it isn't connected, to the powerhouse, that means there is no powerhouse, correct? Sometimes one is connected and one not. You see, sometimes they build that way. One will work and one will not. Just because one doesn't work doesn't mean the other one will. They each, it may work or may not work. So you plug it into one, nothing happens. You plug it into the next one, electric comes out because it is connected. So the same way we make the individual spirit come alive when it is connected to the supreme spirit, the powerhouse. When it is connected to there, even the matter can have some um, spiritual connection. Just like metal and wood and water are not electricity, right? But they are the separated energies. But 
if we collect the energy to the wood, if we make a microphone out of wood, will it work well, make the wires out of wood? Why not? It works with metal. If the electricity comes to the wood, will we feel it? So it means it doesn't exist? Say the cord is sitting here and it is a live wire, right? You won't feel it if you touch here. But if I grab the metal and you throw the cord in the water, and then I, will I feel it then? Yes, because the metal and the water are good conductors of electricity. So we have to use this matter in a way that it is a good conductor of spirit, just like the metal or the wood or the objects are not electricity, but they can properly conduct electricity. So we use this body and we use items like cars and computers and all other items in a way that they can serve Krishna. But we have to remember that if we are stuck in this separated energy, because it is separated from Krishna, we are also separated from Krishna, right? If you go to a place that is not part separated from India, you are separated from India. If you go out in the ocean, you are separated from India. So if we are stuck to this separated energy, then we are separated from Krishna. So we have to realize how to use these three things in the middle. Most people think that the soul is the mind and that the mind is us. So when the mind makes a suggestion, that's us and I have to follow it. If mind has a bad thought, that means I'm bad, correct? No. Krishna explains that we have to let these thoughts come in and go out like the rivers that enter the ocean. The ocean doesn't get all disturbed, it just lets the river come in, lets the river go out. So we may have thoughts that come in that are good ones, we hold on to those. We have thoughts that are bad, we let them go. We're not this mind. The mind is constantly trying to beat us up. The mind is our friend, correct? The mind that's controlled, centered on Krishna, is our friend. And the mind that's not is our enemy. And how long does it take to either put the mind on Krishna or take the mind away? How quickly can you do this? How long it takes? What? Instantly. Instantly you can go either way. We think, oh, I'm at a crossroads. We think that at some point we turned away from the supreme energy and turned to matter. And now we're stuck there. But at every minute, we're either turning towards the Bina Prakriti or towards Krishna, aren't we? Maybe a little of both. Two steps forward and three steps back? That's not too good. At least if we make three steps forward and only two back, at least we're stepping forward. The idea is not to become discouraged wherever we are. If we're running a race and you fall down and skin your knees, do you sit by the road and cry or just get up and keep going? We have to get up and keep going. Because some, you see, some devotees like many of you, they just go on with no faults. Me, I'm an ocean of faults. But I just try to pray to Krishna. You know, Krishna says that he preserves what we have and carry what we lack. And he has to do a lot more carrying what I lack in my case. But that's not a big deal for him, right? Right? Like, there's a picture of, the atlas is, a, is like the, the map of the world because the Greeks thought that Atlas was holding this earth on his shoulders and it was a big burden. But for Krishna, is it a big burden? Does Krishna have sore shoulders because he's holding the earth on them? Or does he say that I'm supporting these all with a fragment of my energy? Just with a fragment of his energy, he's supporting those. So if all these things come from a fragment of his energy, then why are we subject to this Bina Prakriti, because it's easy to see. It's like the hundred rupees I put here, you think is more valuable than the lack of rupees that is underneath that you can't see. So we should think that just because I don't see something doesn't mean there isn't something more valuable to be seen. So generally we get it wrong. We go from the bottom to the top. These matter, the material matter, Above the matter are the senses. 
So since the senses are above the matter, we should follow the senses, right? So what happens generally is the senses become attracted to matter and then the mind follows that and it engages the intelligence how to get ways and means to get more of that, right? So the matter is engaging the mind the, ma the matter is engaging the senses. The senses give directions to the mind. And the mind has the intelligence figure out how to get a hold of these separated energies. But if we are part and parcel of Krishna, and these are separated from Krishna, they're separated from us also. It's kind of like the, the dog sees its reflection, and he's looking at the other dog in the mirror, but there's no real dog there. It's just a reflection. So this material world is like a reflection of the real world. And we are so attracted to this reflection because we can see it. So just because there's some things we don't see doesn't mean they aren't real. Some things we see aren't real. We see that reflection. Is it real? It isn't. It's just a reflection. But we think it's real. So what we have to realize is we should go from the top down. Instead of having the <clears throat> senses enamored by earth, water, fire, and ether, and have the senses direct the mind, what we should do is have the intelligence realize what is best for the soul. This is what the Sankhya means. You know what Sankhya means? What does what Sankhya mean in one word? Counting. Why is it counting? Because we're trying to add up the cost to value ratio. If I say I am giving you 100 rupees for 10 rupees, is that good? If I charge you 1,000, is that good? No. If I charge you 10, it's good. So we think, what is matter and what is spirit? And what am I getting? If the matter things are dead and I become stuck to them, obviously the value is not much no matter how little the cost is. Like I say, okay, I'm gonna give you nothing for a thousand rupees. Okay, what if I give you a 90% discount and I give you nothing for a hundred rupees? That's a 90% discount. You better buy it today, it's on sale. Will you take it? But it's 90% discount, how can you refuse it? Tomorrow price will go back to a thousand rupees. Take it now while it's only hundred rupees. You'd rather take it tomorrow when it's a thousand rupees? Which choice will you take? Will you take it tomorrow when it's a thousand rupees? Or will you take it today when it's a hundred rupees? Which one? You have to choose one or the other. Which one? Which one? Today. This is what the Greeks call a false dichotomy. It doesn't mean, it's like I say, you have to spend either the winter in Sweden or the summer in Delhi. Right? It's a false dichotomy. It isn't true that you have to take it today for a hundred or tomorrow for a thousand. But this is what our mind thinks. If I don't get it now at the cheap price, I have to get it tomorrow at the expensive price. But is that true? It isn't true. But do we think this? Yes. Because if we think something is true, that makes it true. <clears throat> Just like if I make up a lie about you, it's a lie. But if I put it on the internet, that makes it real, right? People say, well, oh, this, this devotee did some terrible things because you should see what I read on the internet. But does that make it real? Because it's on the internet? I can put anything on the internet. So it doesn't make it real just because you read it on the internet. So just because you think that this is the the, the situation. I either get sense gratification at a good price today or I pay more for it tomorrow. But this is what we think. The idea is there's something beyond this false dichotomy. And that is the spirit. So we have to add up that if it's not worth anything, it doesn't matter if it's at a discount price. It isn't worth buying. That we have to try to understand. When things come our way, this is what intelligence does. We have to analyze, okay, if I do this, what will happen? Okay, clock rings. If I go to Mongol Artik, what will happen? I will see the deities of Krishna and Balaram 
Nitai Gore and Radhi Sham, and I will become purified and I will become happy. <clears throat> Say I'm walking down the street and someone offers me a cigarette. I may get different results, right? I may get a cough. I may smell bad. I may not be able to chant as many rounds. I may get cancer. So many different things are there. Which one is good? Which one is bad? The smelling bad, the filling your lungs with smoke, um, taking away from your spiritual program, or e all of the above. Which one? Yes, I walk by and one person is smoking a cigarette and it smells so bad, right? They don't realize how bad it, it smells. So all of these things are true. So we have to think before we do things, like when you're going to buy something. Um, say they're selling a piece of property and it is one, it is two crores of rupees. Do you buy it? You want to find out if the real price is three crores, it's good. If the real price is one crore, it's not true. So first we have to see what we have is the intelligence. Okay, what is being offered to me? And what will I pay for it and what will I get? Because if I get something bad, it doesn't matter if it's free, is it? Right? What will the result of this be? Before we do it, right? We have to think the things carefully. We're not duty bound to just make choices. So we can always think. Let me think about this to see, is it leading me towards Krishna or Bina Prakriti, towards a separated material energy? Think about it carefully. And as we have the choice to place our attention towards Krishna, just like this is the wood, the Bina Prakriti, and this is the microphone. I can or I can speak into the microphone, right? And the choice is that quick, right? Into the wood? Into the microphone. So that quickly we can turn to Krishna and we can turn away. But we tend to think, well, I've already spoken into the matter, so I guess I'm stuck there, I have to keep doing it, right? Is that true? Otherwise we think, oh, I've done so well spiritually, tomorrow I don't have to chant at all. This why I tell people chanting is like breathing. They're both important, but you don't have to do them every day. Is that correct? Is it not correct? If you've breathed every day for 30 years, 60 years, can't you take like one day off? Okay, just an hour, right? An hour? After so long, you can certainly not breathe for a while. It sounds good, doesn't it? Right? But you have to think, what is the real choice? Some things sound good, but they're not true. So we have to analyze, what is the result? Before we do something, we want to find out what it is. Fortunately, we give people a choice. Generally, we want people to take a book and read about it. Come to our temple and see what we're doing. Some of them say, like the Christian ones, they say, we want you to surrender to Jesus right now, right today? before I even like read something about it or find out what it means or what they do or anything, right? Do we initiate people on the point or do they take some time? Especially the new point they teach at the um, disciple training, what's the first thing they do? Who knows? Pick a guru, is that it? Out of a hat? What do they do? What's the first thing they do? No one knows this? What do they get? They hear, but what do they develop first? They're supposed to develop faith in Prabhupada <coughs> for six months, and then they find someone who can guide them in the teachings of Prabhupada. Otherwise, if you haven't studied anything, I can give you instructions from the ninth chap 19th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, and you will think, wow, those are such wonderful instructions that he's giving me from the 19th chapter but obviously you didn't read it, right? So you need to know before you get a guru. What is a guru, right? Right? If I say to you that you should buy a potentiometer, what would you want to know? What would you want to know? I have some potentiometers for sale. What do you want to know? What is it and what else? 
What does it do? Yeah, how does it work? What does it do? You know, oh, good. He has, just like in the business, they call it widgets. So widgets are for sale. And it's just a word. There's no real widget. Oh, I had to buy some widgets. So you buy some because they were for sale. But this is how we work, isn't it? Oh, but they were on sale for half price. So I bought them. Well, what are they worth? They're worth nothing, but at least I got them for half price. So this is our connection with the Bina Prakriti. It's not worth anything, but we think if we can get it cheaper, we're doing well. So we have to understand what is the difference between the God, the living entities, and the Bina Prakriti. And we use the intelligence, meaning we don't just make a quick choice. Say, do you want one of these? You want one of these? What do you find out first? What is it? How will it help me spiritually? <clears throat> There's one thing, it's simple, that you accept everything that's favorable for spiritual life and leads you to Krishna. And you reject everything that's unfavorable and leads you to the Bina Prakriti. Now that's very easy, right? Is that what I said? No, I said it was simple, but I didn't say it was easy. Because sometimes, you know what a car does when it's not aligned properly? It keeps trying to go to the left. So you have to keep pulling it back to the right. It's like Krishna says, we pull the mind back under the control of the self, wherever it tries to wander. So we have to know what the Bina Prakriti is. Quite often we know that Krishna is the solution, but we don't know what our problem is, right? So we have to know that that knowledge of the Sankhya means to understand what these things cause. Okay, if I take this, what will it do? Oh, it's just one little bullet. You can shoot yourself with it, right? Or it's one little drink of alcohol. It, it shouldn't hurt you. You won't get too intoxicated, right? It sounds good, and many people think that. So they have one drink of alcohol, and then what do they say? That worked so well, I should have another, right? Because what happens is, when you've come in contact with the modes, the modes are working. It's like saying, I will jump in the river, but I won't get wet. Once you jumped in the river, you don't get, you get wet. So, we shouldn't have blind faith or blind doubt, but we should think about any activities that come our way. What do they say in Russian? Yisli ne uverian astov etum. If in doubt, leave it out. So, if you're not sure, you know, you do some study, you ask someone else. You know, I say, oh, let's go to some other city right now. Well, what other city? What's going on there? What will I do there? You want to know what you're doing ahead of time. So to stay out of the Bina Prakriti, we have to know what it is. But we have to know that wherever we are, there is Bina Prakriti, and there's also spirit. So wherever we are, we can be connected to the Bina Prakriti, or to the spirit. So are there any questions or comments on this? Parvati, you have something to say about the binas? What's the difference between a bina and a vina? A vina. A vina. A vina is a flute and it's not a bina because it's connected to Krishna, right? The Vina. Venu. I got it wrong. So any comments? Does that mean nobody listened or it was all understood? All right, we'll end there then. Jai, all glories to Sri the Prabhupada.